Uh, okay, good afternoon. Um, today we're going to be talking about transformative resilience in the context of climate change. Okay. So when we talk about resilience, we talk about it um, contextually as relating to the capacity of individuals, families and communities to work within their social and physical environment to absorb and withstand shocks. Um, now, climate change, and when we talk about climate change, we're referring to the capacity to bounce back after major climate event and ongoing economic and social challenges. So resilience is about, is, is traditionally talked about as that capacity of people to um, bounce back after such an event. Now, when we talk about transformative resilience, however, we're talking about the capacity of people to actually bounce forward um, into a new normal and to implement changes to a system that is no longer viable. In relation to agriculture, we, we refer to it as the capacity to make radical changes and to introduce new rules to the game in the social, environmental and economic spheres that shape agriculture. So the methodology that we've been using are results from a collaboration between Monash and Penn State Universities. We've undertaken qualitative interviews with women and men engaged in agriculture. So far, um, we've been looking at three Australian locations that have experienced disasters associated with climate change and conducting interviews remotely because of the COVID situation. Particularly, we're interested in running a gendered lens over transformative resilience. So what I'm going to um, talk to you about today is just one of those sites that we've been looking at. And that's a site in northeastern Victoria, Australia. So you can see the map of Australia and um, the yellow is uh, where Victoria is, and that's um, Victoria enlarged. And we're talking about a, a, an area that is um, in the northeast of that state. It's a primarily dairy and livestock farming area, and it has suffered from recent disasters, including the massive bushfires of 2019-20. There's also been floods and uh, a devastating collapse of milk prices that affected dairy farmers. Overlaid on all of that is COVID-19, and this particular area has experienced 137 days in lockdown um, over the period of, of COVID, and that means there's been severe limits on their movement and activity. So this is an area that has been buffeted by disasters. In relation to women in agriculture, we wanted to make some points about women being engaged in agriculture through family and or marriage, and how there's a dominance of patrilineal inheritance practices around land ownership in these areas, and commensurate with that is patriarchal control of um, the industry and the farm. Um, it has less social and material capital. There is less social and material capital in agricultural industries these days. Um, women's agricultural labor is underreported worldwide and particularly in the category of family workers, despite the farm family often being dependent on their off-farm income generation. That's a really important point to make that despite the fact that women's work's underreported, it actually underpins um, a lot of agriculture. And women are also often engaged in book work, in off-farm income generation and community engagement activities. Um, some quotes from uh, some of the women that we've been talking to. Um, one of them told us that the most profitable thing was me going out to work. That was about how we made farming pay. As we used to say in the 80s, how do you diversify a farm? You marry a teacher or a nurse. And um, another woman told us about, she said, don't let them know how good you are in the dairy. Um, this is uh, advice she received from her mother-in-law when she moved to the farm. Don't let them know how good you are in the dairy because you don't want to get caught up in there. And once I went to uni and got my degree, that was my ticket out of the dairy. And another woman said, I struggle with the word resilience somewhat. 
what does it actually mean? Because I'm not happy and great every single day, but I am able to bounce back or bounce forward or continue when things have, uh, yes, got a bit hard. So women are very conscious of their role and, and what's going on in agriculture. In terms of our results, we have isolated for the purpose of this um, presentation four overarching themes, individual responsibility versus larger structural forces, community engagement, resistance to gender, and accessing resources. So let's talk about the first one, individual responsibility versus larger structural forces. Um, in Australia, individual responsibility for circumstances really does underpin government funding and policy. There's this expectation that individuals, um, farmers, farm families will take responsibility for uh, what's going on on their farm. So this has a huge impact about things like climate change and Australia's lack of climate change acknowledgement and the recent negotiation, for example, of removing climate action as a requirement for a trade deal with UK indicates how um, raw this is. Now, that sort of anticipated um, responsibility passing back to individuals has huge implications if the government's not going to act because there's limited agency amongst individuals. And government policy and funding programs shape people's capacity to respond to things like climate change, et cetera. For example, Australia's national resilience statement based on, is based on the concept of shared responsibility, which can be seen as shifting responsibility to individuals when systemic changes are needed at government and global level. So that puts enormous pressure on, um, on people and on families because of their inability to challenge systems. And that locks people in. We also note that this also is overlaid by rigid gender stereotypes. So this quote uh, from a male dairy farmer, he said, how do you become resilient in a circumstance that's out of your control? And when Murray Goulburn, which was the milk company, when that collapsed, we said, screw this, we're running businesses here. The volatility we found was unbelievably stressful. And I'm a pretty resilient person, I think. And I probably put on a brave face in front of um, partner and the family. Our second uh, theme that we wanted to cover was community engagement. And what we found is that women will engage with community, they'll organize events, they'll support community activities. They're very adept at building community. Um, men, on the other hand, resisted getting help while women sought support from their communities but were often belittled for it. So this dynamic was harmful to both the women and the men caught up in it. And it suggests that where there are rigid gender stereotypes at play, then transformative resilience may be less accessible to both women and men. Um, now, issues with COVID and lockdowns have diminished this avenue even further. And this quote from a female beef farmer, we used to do the sandwiches and put them into individual bags with, with what they were written on it. Um, I always said for the firefighters, you buy the best. And that's what we did. And then one, one night, this woman rang and said, um, she said to me, what right have you got to be providing food for the firefighters? And I said, well, my husband's a captain. And I said, he asked me, and would I get some food for the firefighters? And I said, we have got it organised. Yeah. So this was um, this implicit uh, understanding by the women that they would provide food in an emergency was sort of undercut by um, government regulations about food safety, et cetera. Our third theme that we wanted to talk about today is resistance to gender. Now, we've found strong gender stereotypes and norms um, dominate rural Australia. And for men, this can lead to violence. It can lead to suicide. But men resist getting together and sharing. They resist getting um, support because of this strong sense of stoicism that they're meant to be okay, so they've got to try and be okay. 
and that fear of expressing failure. So you've got these overarching themes coming together where men um, are feeling the pressure but are unable to resist because there is no um, government support. So individual responsibility is meant to be so strong and under, underpins government policy. So this leads to this sense of uh, that men have that they, they should be able to do it when often there are circumstances that make that difficult. So men are reluctant to discuss gender, but they do comment on men's reluctance to share information and feelings with each other. They tend to make fun of or diminish women and their efforts in the community. As one sheep and grain farmer said to us, what we need to do is ban mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. Um, and what he meant was from the business of farming because he felt like women were um, getting too involved where they shouldn't be, which was rather alarming. Um, however, some, however, some men did recognise changing gender roles. And as one male sheep farmer said, at the micro level, where you've got some movers and shakers, I think most of them are young women. And um, so some men are starting to recognise the significance of women's engagement with community. Our fourth theme is around accessing resources. And what we found here is there's significant um, red tape and bureaucracy that dogs this sort of process of trying to get resources. Um, there's also this heavy gender division of labor where women tend to do the books and women's organizations have in fact been allocated the task sometimes of distributing funds for people. Um, Overlaid on all this is this poor IT service and Wi-Fi dropping out all the time. And um, this leads to social and economic issues. Um, and we see again this sense of neoliberalism and individual responsibility, but then the service infrastructure not being there to support what is needed. And one female orchardist said to us, so the emotional and practical side of actually buying water and making sure that the farm could run was left to quite a lot of the other women. And I knew I knew did that as well because we did the books, that was sort of our area. And the men, they were just busy during those peak times of the drought in 04, especially I remember. There was a lot to do out there on the farm. Um, so overall in terms of community led recovery, Australian policy emphasises this community-led um, recovery. And um, nonetheless, that impact of that on women is, is really unacknowledged. What's happening is a co-option of women's labour, both on the farm and in the realms of um, government support, et cetera, or lack of support. Uh, but there is a move to a shared community-led recovery that hasn't been examined with a gender lens because community-led recovery is actually built on women's labour. Um, and what we have at the moment is COVID complications that reveal and in fact compound the problem. Um, and a female beef farmer said to us, yes, 90% volunteering. And, uh, um, and I used to say to the council, you might look at that and think, gee, that's fantastic. But what you've got to say is, well, who are these people? How long are they going to be there? That's not good. Because what that means is there's a huge gap there in service delivery that people from the community are having to fill. So in conclusion then, I wanted to say, unless gender is recognised and supported, individuals and communities cannot address resilience and they will continue to be harmed. There's a need to support the ongoing responsibility women are taking on within their communities. And there's a need for a gender lens when addressing transformative resilience. Now this needs to be driven by a strengths-based approach so that with funding, resilience can in fact be transformative. Um, we are going to move on to uh, do sites in the US. So we'll be looking at the implications in, in that country as well. So thank you very much for listening and um, enjoy your day. <laughs>